Ever since 20th Century Fox released The House on 92nd Street in 1945, the studio enjoyed a close working relationship with the Federal Bureau of Investigation. FBI Director J. Edgar Hoover granted the studio access to FBI facilities, case files, and surveillance equipment, all part of Hoover's PR campaign to assure the public that the FBI was the nation's first and last line of defense against crooks, spies, and terrorists. It was also Hoover's habit of vetting any film that involved or even invoked the actions of the FBI. When Pickup on South Street was screened for the FBI prior to its release, Hoover went ballistic. He immediately demanded a meeting in Hollywood with studio boss Daryl Zanuck at a deluxe Beverly Hills restaurant, of course. The meeting was also attended by the film's writer-director, Samuel Fuller. Hoover was enraged by what he felt was the movie's cavalier attitude toward the war on communism. He was particularly outraged by the cynical and unpatriotic behavior of the film's leading man. Well, you boys are talking in the wrong corner. I'm just a guy keeping my hands in my own pockets. If you refuse to cooperate, you'll be as guilty as the traitors that gave Stalin the A-bomb. Are you waving the flag at me? Hoover told the writer that Skip McCoy needed to come around to the right attitude. Fuller told Hoover to go pound salt, declaring that his characters were fine, just as they were. Caught between a rock and a hard place, Zanuck stood up for Fuller. He told Hoover that no changes would be made to the film, instantly ending a cozy eight-year relationship between Fox and the FBI. The only thing Hoover did manage to change was the film's advertising. Posters that had already been printed with the tagline, How the FBI Took a Chance on a B-Girl, were pasted over with a snipe that read, How the Law Took a Chance on a B-Girl. One of the most fascinating aspects of Sam Fuller's work is how it managed to antagonize people at both ends of the political spectrum. Critics with liberal agendas often characterized him as a hawkish right-winger while jingoistic conservative reviewers claimed Fuller was sympathizing with communists in his 1950 war films, The Steel Helmet, Fixed Bayonets, and China Gate. The confusion stemmed from Fuller always pursuing a humanist throughline in his stories, never an ideological one, something that routinely confounded people viewing everything with their own agendas. Fuller laughed it off for the most part, except when Pickup on South Street was released in France. A communist sympathizer on the film review board demanded that the story's villains be changed from communist spies to garden variety drug dealers, which was easily accomplished through inaccurate subtitling. The film was even retitled La Porte de la Druge, The Port of Drugs. Ironically, Fuller's reputation would soon receive its biggest boost in France, where the critics at the influential Cahiers du Cinéma magazine lauded him as one of the most exciting and instinctive American filmmakers. One of those critics, future filmmaker Jean-Luc Godard, later gave Fuller a cameo in his 1965 film Perrault le Fou. Fuller famously offered his terse and completely unsurprising definition of cinema. Film is like a battleground. There's love, hate, action, violence, death. In one word, emotion. And Godard was far from alone in his admiration of Fuller. In his later years, Sam became a kind of spiritual and creative guru for an incredible array of filmmakers the world over, from Vim Vendors to Quentin Tarantino, from Curtis Hansen to Jim Jarmusch. This is the fourth life I mentioned earlier. I highly recommend Sam's autobiography, A Third Face, a book that should be mandatory reading for all American school kids who've lost touch with the kind of people who truly made this country great. And if you don't have time for an epic read, then check out the documentary, A Fuller Life, made by Sam's daughter, Samantha. And here's a couple of bits of musical trivia. Playing in the background of several scenes is the song, Again. If that sounds familiar, maybe you've seen the Fox film in which Ida Lupino introduced it, Roadhouse, co-starring Richard Widmark. And for the film's most memorable moment, Moe's death scene, Fuller demanded the studio buy a piece of music he'd fallen in love with, a record called Mamzelle. Mamzelle. 
Williams. That has to be the tune, he declared. Spare no expense in getting the rights. Well, it turns out the price was zero because the tune was written by director Edmund Goulding for the 1946 Fox film The Razor's Edge, which Goulding directed. With lyrics by Mac Gordon, there were five versions of the song released in 1947 alone, including hits by Dick Hames, Dennis Day, Frankie Lane, and Frank Sinatra. Next week, we have a story about a child who suffers traumatic memory loss after witnessing a murder and the culprit who wants to wipe out her memory for good. Be here for Zachary Scott, Gigi Perot, and Anne Southern, and Shadow on the Wall. In the meantime, keep the conversation going on the Noir Alley Facebook page and Twitter feed. Until then, ladies, keep those purses fastened tight. And fellas, carry your wallet in your front pocket, a tip I picked up from a canon named Skip McCoy. <laughs>